our reading today from the first letter of St. John mentions something uh, which I found quite surprising when I heard it for the first time. When we think of the Antichrist, um, sorry, I'm just diving straight in. Uh, when we think of the, uh, don't think too much or too long about the Antichrist, but when we hear the word, the Antichrist, um, we probably think of, you know, Satan incarnate, basically. Uh, so uh, horns, red skin, tail, trident, all that kind of thing. Um, or just some, something kind of raw evil. We think of, uh, I don't know, desecrating the Eucharist, or uh, we think of just awful things like that. So how does scripture describe the Antichrist? Well, it's, it's while it, I'm sure the Antichrist would do those horrible things as well, um, there's an, a point that, that St. John makes here, which I guess I wouldn't have thought of uh, primarily. <clears throat> St. John tells us that you can tell the spirits that come from God by this. Every spirit which acknowledges that Jesus the Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But any spirit which will not say this of Jesus is not from God, but is the spirit of the Antichrist. The incarnation, right? So spirits that are from God recognize that God became man, that Jesus, the second person of the Holy Trinity, took on a human nature. And the spirit of the Antichrist will deny that God became man. You'd think, well, why, why is that so important? Why is that the key thing? I mean, obviously, it's, it's, it's good that Jesus became man. But why is that absolutely key? Why is that so central to the whole message uh, of the gospel? And, and keep in mind that <clears throat> this particular teaching, this particular truth, is quite regularly denied. That, you know, Jesus was a good man. Jesus helped people. Jesus was nice. Jesus was a good philosopher. Uh, Jesus uh, was, uh, is, is, a, is a, a good friend. Uh, was a just man who helped people and, um, and all of that. But not mentioning that Jesus is God. Right? That is, it, it needs to be said so, so clearly because if not, we're starting to stray into a kind of a territory which is kind of dangerous here. Right? It's the territory of the Antichrist. If we deny that, that Jesus is God, that Jesus became man, so that, that, that the second person of the Holy Trinity took on a human nature, uh, that's straight out of hell. Right? And why is that so important? Why is it so important that we recognize this truth about the incarnation? So much hinges on it. We've, we've said this uh, numerous times here. But so much hinges on this truth. Jesus becomes man, so the whole Christmas event, right? Jesus takes on a human nature in order that he can die in it. <clears throat> Jesus takes on a human nature in order that he can take it to the cross and die in that human nature in order to set us free from our sins, in order to get us to heaven. So no human nature, no dying on the cross, no dying on the cross. Redemption can't happen. We can't get to heaven. So it, this, 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 this is absolutely key. If Jesus died on the cross but isn't God, I'm sure there are plenty of people who died as martyrs and plenty of innocent people uh, who died in tragic circumstances. But that doesn't, you know, the world goes on. But the fact that Jesus died, Jesus who is God, that changes absolutely everything. This is what God is willing to do out of love for you. This is what you're worth in his eyes. Like that's, just astounding and that's why it's it's such an important truth such a, a, a kind of an obvious truth in a way and yet is actually so often not recognized or denied uh, that where Jesus is just degraded to the level of a as I say a nice guy philosopher um, historical figure or, but but just not God incarnate anything but just not God incarnate and even the way I was brought up in my own faith, how I would have learned the faith in school, we didn't talk about Jesus as, as God made man, or even why that was important. Um, it was, you know, Jesus who, uh, he had a great effect on history, right? You know, Christianity and the Roman Empire then spread in Christianity throughout the known world and so on and so forth. So, so yeah, he was a historical character that had a great influence, but not God incarnate. You know, everything and anything, but just not the central, most important truth, which is that he is God made man. Uh, yesterday I came across a, an email which was sent to me from uh, uh, an American group called uh, Focus. Uh, 
And the title of the email was, Wise Men Still Seek Him. And I thought, oh, I like that. Wise men still seek him. So we should not think that in order to follow the Lord, you have to be somewhat dim-witted and maybe be kind of you know, in need, like have some sort of a, a chronic problem that you can't fix and therefore you need God. Uh, or there's just there's some gaping hole in your life that, that nothing else will fix. So just insert God there. Just, you know, it's the opium of the simple. Uh, just, just make yourself feel good by having this imaginary friend up there in the sky. Uh, so this idea that if you're smart, you don't believe in God, or that smart people don't believe in God, that's just completely stupid. Uh, it's ridiculous to think that if you're more intelligent, you're less likely to believe in God. That's kind of a contemporary thing at the moment. But um, that wasn't always the case. I mean, even to your, your, your Greek philosophers back in the day, your Plato's and Aristotle's, they believed uh, in some sort of a divinity, some sort of a uh, primary cause. Uh, they, don't, they didn't know God as we know him, but they, they, to believe there's something outside this material universe was, was quite common amongst the elite, amongst the smart people. And the amount of, of uh, like the, 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 the saints throughout the ages, uh, so many of them very, very intellectually capable men, men and women. So to believe that uh, if you're smart, you'll probably work out that God isn't really real. That's just ridiculous. That is plain ridiculous. Um, Richard Dawkins, in his book, The God Delusion, he uh, explains or kind of hypothesizes he says that, that the God almost, it's almost impossible for God to exist. He doesn't say God doesn't exist, but he says it's extremely, extremely, extremely unlikely. But then the inevitable question comes up, okay, where did, all the, where did the universe come from, though? So we have a universe. We can see that it's fairly, fairly complex. Uh, where did it come from? Uh, and he says, well, basically, you can d d explain everything if he, has, he describes what he calls Mount Improbable. So here we go, I've not got no, no blackboard. So Mount Improbable. He says, if you want to scale this side of Mount Improbable, that's gonna be pretty hard, it's just too steep. So the idea that things are created quickly or that species developed quickly, that's, that's ridiculous. But he would say, but you can develop any species if you go up the gentle slope of Darwinism. So survived with the fittest, natural selection. But the issue with this, while all these graphs look fine, and you can see these graphs of you know, single cell organisms, multi cell organisms, jellyfish, and then jellyfish go from fish and lizards, and then lizards go to mammals and birds, and you know, all the graph just kind of, and then chimpanzees, and then man. Uh, you know, it all looks very simple. Uh, but the, the, the issue is like on, on, on the level of any particular change in a species, right? In order for this to happen, Firstly, the change has to happen all at once. I'll explain that in a sec. And secondly, the, the change that's required is, is huge. Okay, so you say you've got a jellyfish. Right? Just keep it, you can think of any, any, any level of, of, you can take any animal, right, and uh, look at what's required for it to become the next species, okay, like according to this wee graph. So you've got a jellyfish. Now, Jellyfish just get carried wherever they're going by the current, right? They have no muscles, so they just get carried around. They just kind of float around. Oh, current's going this way. Now, in order, imagine now that this, this jellyfish is going to develop an eye. Now, the eye on its own is so incredibly complicated, okay? It has to be able to take in light and then process that light, do something with it. So it has to be able to focus, so you have to have like an iris, and, you know, you have to be able to adjust the, the, the level of light, so that if it's dark, it can open up, let in more light, if it's too bright, it can close down. So your iris, pupil, uh, you've got various lenses, you've got your aqueous humor, you've got your water and all that behind it in order to, you know, that the eyeball doesn't dry up. Um, it has to be able to clean itself somehow, you know, eyelids or something, okay. But then eyeball, if the eyeball is developed, right? Say you have an eyeball. Eyeball is no good on its own without some sort of a nerve carrying that light back to a brain. Like an eyeball on its own is useless. Eyeball needs to be connected to the brain. But then, if eyeball is connected to the brain, but you still have no muscles, you can see, oh, oh, we're going straight for, straight for the cliff edge. Oh, and nothing you can do about it. Oh, oh, here's a shark. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. You know, and you can't move, which means after all that development, jellyfish with eyeball gets eaten by shark. End of story. 
the species don't develop, right? Which means that in order for, for any of these developments in a species to be useful, it all has to come at once. Half an eyeball is useless. So, well, if these species have a half an eyeball for a while, and then a million years later, it develops the nerve endings, and then a million years later after that, it develops the brain, and then a million years after that, it develops the, the, the muscles. No, it's just that, that half an eyeball is no advantage to the species whatsoever. It's either useful or useless. Half, half an organ is useless. You know, so it, these, these kind of things just, just don't make sense to say, well, if you give it enough time, just give it enough time, it'll all work out. We see this incredibly complicated world around us. And the more we discover about it, the more we discover how complicated it is. You know, we thought it was complicated 200 years ago, and then we discovered DNA. Holy moly, this went off the, the, the Richter scale altogether with complicatedness. You know, like we're, that we're, uh, like that these like proteins assembled in a certain way that make up our body. That these are the, the DNA is like the letters that make up uh, our, our, our genetic makeup. Uh, then those letters are combined in certain ways to form genomes, genes, and they, these write, they write who you are, what, what color hair you're going to have, how tall you're going to be, what color your skin is going to be, all this kind of thing. It's just, I just read this morning, the human genome, uh, if you're to quantify it in contemporary terms of data, it's about one and a half gigabytes, which is uh, uh, 1,500 megabytes, okay? 1,500 megabytes. The whole catechism, I just checked it this morning, I have it on a Word document. The whole catechism is just a little over two megabytes. And your genetic makeup is 1,500 megabytes. All by chance, apparently. To combine you so perfectly that you can move and think and see and have abstract thought and that we can do this, that we can worship God, all of that by chance, apparently. Or if you give dogs enough time, they'll eventually develop to the same stage or something. It's just, you see, it, when, you think, when you kind of step back from the, the, these, these hypotheses, which are uh, presented with such confidence, you go, hold on, this just not, doesn't actually make sense. You know, it just doesn't make sense. Like, to that a species can simply, that, as I say, it, it, they say, well, it, it, it'll develop slowly into the next species. But slow development doesn't work. I mean, you, you know, you can have a, a weak horse that, you know, eventually gets stronger, and then the stronger horses are the horses with more hair in a cold country will survive the winter. So therefore, the mangy, skinny horses die, and then the horses that survive are either smaller or he heavier or stronger. Okay, they're still a horse, though. They're still the same species. They're a slightly bigger horse, slightly smaller horse. But they're not an elephant, you know. So it's just, at times, it just doesn't make sense. So it's good for us to look at our created world. Wise men still seek him. That as, as intelligent people, we still seek God. And as we look at creation around us, it should absolutely fascinate us that there is a creator who has made this out of love for us, an intelligent designer who has patience. He has all the time in the world. There's no panic. There's no rush. So he creates things and sets, sets a process in motion? Absolutely. Doesn't mean he didn't create it just because it's a process. But the, the idea then that uh, your, 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 your uh, skeptic will say, well, but who created God? Well, let's see. then you've got the, the issue here then of if someone created God, then God is so simply a part of creation. And created gods always disappoint. If God is merely created, of course he's going to disappoint. Created gods always disappoint. The whole point is that God is not created. He's the uncaused cause. He's not himself created, but he creates. So he's outside of the created system. Otherwise, if you're just part of the system, then who created the guy who created God? Who created the guy who created God? Who created God? And it's infinite regression. So you end up still with the same question, just a little further back. Where did it all begin? How did it all start? Who created the first God who created the other gods? The whole point is that God is uncreated and sets a process in motion with a, an intelligent design that there's a goal to it all and there's a beauty to it all. When you look at the artist, you, you can see something. When you look at the art, you can see something about the artist. And even this morning now we have snow here in Glencomer and the place is looking particularly beautiful. Uh, so there's something beautiful about our, the heart of our intelligent designer. 
Wise men still seek God. Wise men still seek him. Our faith is firmly rooted in reason. We have nothing to be intimidated by when, when smart scientists say that it's all made up. Uh, it's actually prove, prove it. Or you, you, you come up with a, with a better theory as to where the world came from. Uh, Richard Dawkins actually, he hypothesizes that we have our universe and there are multiple universes in a megaverse which are all competing for existence, just like the survival of the fittest and Darwinism in, in general. So all these universes are competing for existence, and then the bigger or the better universes will survive, and the small universes will be absorbed. And then from that megaverse, it can happen that a black hole will create uh, an entryway into a new megaverse. And you go, oh, that's lovely. You see all in the diagrams, the little big circles, and so the big circles, and your little black hole, and out pops your other little universe, so it creates a new megaverse. Sorry, have you a shred of proof for any of this? Have you a shred? We, can, we, we, we hardly even know the size of our own universe. Have you any proof at all that there's a universe outside of this universe? Anything? Anything? Give me anything. No. Well, best of luck. <laughs> all right. We, we, we think that God did it, which doesn't mean that by the way we can't uh, investigate scientifically into the world. We should, and the church was at the, the forefront of, of much of it. Even the idea of the Big Bang was proposed by a, a, a priest, Father George Lemaitre. So we have nothing to be intimidated by when, when smart people or scientific people say it is all made up. It, it, we can actually stand on our own two feet. Right from the beginning, John Paul II was fantastic with, with, with his, his, his authorship of faith and reason, fides et ratio. You know, that, that our, our faith goes together with reason. Don't believe in God by turning off your brain. Please don't do that. Always keep your brain turned on, right? I learned that the hard way as a teenager. Um, keep your brain turned on before you speak. Uh, so faith and reason, faith and reason. And so we ask the good Lord to continue to guide us and the scientific community and the elite of our society that in all humility we might follow the example of our wise men though and recognize that wise men still seek him. Amen.